to order. This is a joint meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee and the Education Finance Committee. Um, we are happy to be here today to talk about um, all things related to early childhood. And um, just to, to um, introduce the meeting, um, I just wanted to say a couple of things uh, about, about our meeting today. Um, I believe that um, children's experiences from birth to when they enter kindergarten are incredibly important. And it's the time when uh, the most rapid brain development is happening. Um, the science of brain development is, is well understood and it's also well understood that high quality experiences in the, during the birth to five year, five year old years have a large impact on improving health, academic, social, emotional, um, and other outcomes in life. Investing in high quality care and education programs will not only get kids off to a great start and help families be happy and healthy, it will also help promote better outcomes in our E12 system and help strengthen Minnesota's economy. So today's um, presentations will provide uh, uh, background on the brain science of child development. Um, it will provide a presentation on the information on current economics of the birth to five years for families and the powerful effect that early interventions can have for families. Uh, we'll talk about current challenges within our early care and education system due to the lack of public investment. And we'll talk about some of the ways that we are working to address the challenges uh, with the Great Start Task Force that recently um, issued its report just yesterday, and uh, one of the governor's proposals to develop a new agency focused on children. So we'll begin today uh, with a presentation by uh, Dr. Megan Gunnar, and um, she will be talking about child development, brain architecture, um, and it's really a pleasure to have you here presenting for us. Um, it's it's been a pleasure uh, for me to learn from you over the years about um, child development and early, especially the early years. So I really appreciate your, your coming today. And I think members will, um, if you have questions after uh, a presentation, we could take a few questions then. Um, and we do have uh, a lot to, to cover, but I do also want to allow if you do have questions. So um, we will we'll see after each presentation if, if there are any questions. And um, if you could introduce yourself, Dr. Gunner, and, and proceed. Well, thank you, Senator Wicklin, and, and you helped me with my first slide. Uh, my name is Megan Gunner. I'm a Regents Professor at the University of Minnesota in the Institute of Child Development, and this is my first time back to the legislature after I was here with my hat in hand, begging for money to build a new Institute of Child Development, which you all did bond and has been built, and I welcome you to come over. It's glorious, um, and we are so happy that our undergraduates are back in the building and that we're able to do the kind of research that, that will help benefit the state. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you for one minute. Um, the presentation is being printed, and we just received it this morning, and we're, we're getting it printed, so you'll, you'll get that um, shortly, so... Right, Please you don't proceed. need to scribble and scrawl. All of it will come to you. So um, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm here um, like you are here because we care about the future success of our children and of Minnesota. Uh, we spend end of our uh, end of our nation. And I'm here to put some flesh on the bones of the idea that that success is based on healthy development, healthy child development, and in particular, in this talk, healthy brain development. Healthy brain development of our children forms the foundation for educational achievement, economic productivity, as Erin will be talking about, responsible citizenship, and we are increasingly understanding its role in lifelong health and many of the diseases of aging which have their origins in the earliest years of life and in things that are affecting brain and body development. Healthy child development is the basis for strong communities, a healthy economy, and the successful parenting of the next generation. And so much of what we have to worry about is how individuals who have not had that great start when they become parents are not making a good income, are struggling themselves, and 
um, it's always a two or three generation problem that we're facing. Now, to build a healthy brain takes more than just having good genes. We once thought genetics basically laid out the framework and the brain just developed based on the genes that we had. We now know that those genes are always in dynamic interaction with the information coming to them and that experience literally writes on our genes and determines when and how our genes are turned on and turned off. And this is a process called epigenetics, which some of you have probably heard about. Let me try to explain how this works. You are seeing here a neuron. And in the neuron, this is backward high school biology, is a nucleus. And in that nucleus, we have chromosomes. We have 23 pairs of them. And those chromosomes are made up of, of DNA. Along that DNA, we have these regions that are at genes, and those genes code for proteins. Now, you maybe notice here that there are these little blue balls that the DNA seems to be wrapped around. Those are histones. Those are proteins, and they're very important because along that region of DNA, sort of at the start of a gene, there's what's called a promoter region. And that promoter region interacts, gets information from what's around it in the cell. And on that promoter region are receptor elements that will then decide whether that gene is turned on or off. If the information can't get to those promoter regions, then nothing is happening and that gene will be silenced. And that happens when that gene is so, DNA is so tightly wound around those proteins that no information can get in, okay? The open regions are where the information can come. The very heavily wrapped up regions are where it can't. Critically important, of course, because we'd be a one-celled organism if every cell in our body operated the same way, right? So much of this, um, has to do, happens before birth and creates liver cells versus brain cells and so on. It happens in part by the addition of these little methyl marks on the DNA that tell it how tightly to wind around those histones. Does that make sense? Much of this, as I said, happens before birth as we go from being a single-celled organism to that beautiful, glorious baby that you welcome into your lives with a very complex body and nervous system at that point. But we now understand that it continues to happen after birth, especially in those early years of life, as this is a way that nature has figured out how to adapt us to our environment. We live in very different environments with very different demands. We are a human species with basic human genes, but our genes get adapted to our environment. Some of this we learned first from cancer geneticists who were figuring out why cells go wild later on, but we now know it's a very normal process of adapting the individual to its environment. This begins before birth including in regions that will have to do with intellectual competence and physical health. It's not just differentiating the body. So I have to tell you, we cannot begin at birth, and we cannot end at age four, okay? But what happens between birth and age four that your committee will have a chance to have a big influence on is awfully important. And let me give you an example of how this might be. This is actually, I'm talking monkeys here, guys. These are rhesus monkeys. And they were raised either with their mother, these guys here, there are four of them raised with their mother, and four of them that were raised on one of those Harry Harlow cloth surrogates, okay? No mama, but something to cling to. And this is a little piece of the prefrontal cortex that was taken out when, yes, these monkeys were sacrificed. And a process was done to identify how many methyl marks were on over 1,300 genes that they looked at. And what I hope you can see, and it doesn't need stats, red means more methylated, green means less. Each one of these lines across here is a different gene. You could tell, you could organize this without statistics into which ones had a mother with them and which ones didn't. Their genes got adapted to that context of neglect or a supportive parenting. And this was in the first three months of the monkey's life, which is like the first 12 months of our lives. Does that make sense? So this is a very powerful way that nature has figured out. And she doesn't hate us. 
She's attempting to adapt us for survival. And survival, as far as nature is concerned, is all about whether you can have babies that will live in the next generation, because you want to get your genes there. It's not about whether you're happy. It's not about whether you're healthy. It's not about really how long you live, as long as you live to reproductive fitness. But it is adapting you to your context. The other way that our brains get adapted is that our brains literally become what our brains think about. So what you're looking at here, this happens to be, again, a slice from the prefrontal cortex, but it could be from other parts of the brain. And in this initial state, these are neurons. And if you notice, they're not connected to one another. A neuron that doesn't get to talk to another neuron doesn't do anything. But under, this is genetic control, at a certain point, there'll be this proliferation of connections that occur. And now, things are not very efficient but they're communicating. In fact, they're over-communicating. What's going to happen over time is the neurons that send messages that produce effective responses get confirmed. They get fed more. They get, and the ones that don't will go away. So that at the end of the sensitive period, you will have a brain that processes the information it needs to process very quickly. The issue for us is what information do we want that brain processing very quickly? Do we want it processing threat and kicking in defensive responses? Do we want it thinking about um, numbers and letters and building a TIE fighter with Legos and doing all sorts of great things and going to the museums and so on and what they're thinking about? So that's our challenge. We are creating a brain that thinks really well about what it's been thinking about we're going to hopefully guide it thinking about things and being a great brain processor for the things our society needs for that brain to be able to do, and so the kid's happy. These circuits are wired from the bottom up, so you initially get the sensory regions, right? Baby gets pretty good at seeing and hearing and finally being able to, you know, and so on. Then you get these language regions beginning to wire up, and then the higher order cognitive functions wiring up, after, everything's, after things are wired, they get myelinated, so that whole process for the higher cognition is not really over till age 25, and then it sort of goes the other direction. But the main point here is that so much of this is occurring in the early years of life, and you rarely think about any problem with just one part of your brain. Skills beget skills, and a brain that is well put together supports the development of those higher regions that help us later learn algebra and, and so forth and so on. So those early years, we often talk about them as the first thousand days, but really it's more than that. Um, it's really from conception up through the first four or five years of life are very critically important for laying the foundation for what's gonna come. Now, you have to wonder what nature was thinking about. This complicated, beautiful human brain that needs to think about stuff in order to become brilliant, is born among the most helpless of mammals on the planet. Can't get its hand to its mouth, can't roll over, can't do anything on its own for many months. And yet, we need to have this brain stimulated. And parents will say, I wish it came with a, with a manual, right, so that I knew what to do. Well, it sort of does, because it comes with fussing, crying, and cooing and making sounds, and in responsive contexts, our brains evolved to develop in the context of responsive relationships. Parents, certainly, but other relationships are also important, including teachers, peers, and so on. In the, con in the context of a rich set of relationships, the brain has a lot to think about, right? We talk about this as sensitive, responsive, interactions with children, but you can think about it as like serve and return if you're playing a game of tennis, the baby makes it serve, you return it, etc. Remember I said nerves had to be confirmed? When I send a signal and it gets a good response, ah, that set was useful, gets confirmed. Or a call and response, depending on what metaphor works for you. The barriers to early educational achievement are beginning very, very early. This is an old study, but it's been replicated in many ways. It was done initially in terms of social class. We now know it really is about the um, 
quality of the language and communication and interaction occurring with the baby it may not even be words, but here it happens to be. So in some, in some contexts, babies are part of very few conversations, more, and in some contexts, they're parts of a lot. And we know if we, this is study, um, if we look at the uh, vocabulary the kids have, and this was done by sending graduate students into the home for several hours over time, and they recorded every word the baby spoke. Well, no surprise, at 16 months, not a lot of words coming out of the kids' mouths, regardless of the language context. Though, we have ways of looking at whether they understand those words, and they are understanding based on language context. Mm -hmm. But between 16 and 24 months of age, there's this huge burst of language. And I have to tell you, one of the things about having words is every word is a concept. And the more language you understand, the more concepts you have. And the more concepts you have, the more you can learn. Okay, so we get this burst and we begin to see this differentiation and by 36 months of age, there is your achievement gap. Because the kids who are coming from a high language context will come to school with many concepts and many ways to be able to learn and they'll go gangbusters and the others will come to school and school will help them a lot, but they will be playing catch up and their teachers will be playing catch up with them. This pattern actually maps well with what we know about brain volume. This study was done by Jamie Hansen over in Milwaukee. He was at the University of Madison in Wisconsin. He followed babies from the time they were five months until they were 37 months, imaging them repeatedly. And he was looking at total gray matter volume. If you are a aficionado of Hercule Poirot, these are the little gray cells that do all this thinking, right? And what you see here as a function of social class, but I would almost guarantee you it's a function of how much enrichment the children are experiencing. You begin to see over time that now by the time they're three, the actual brain volume that children have is a function of, of the enrichment they've experienced. Now that doesn't mean the brains cannot develop more. Your brain still can make connections. It's a little harder for us, right? We gotta work harder at those connections. But early in life, it's easier, and these kids at three will be able, I'm sure, but they'll be coming from behind. So this is why this early period is so important in setting things up for all that will come later. It's not because we can't fix things, it's because it's harder. Okay, so what are the enriching experiences? We, I mean, there are many. You do not have to live in an urban area with libraries, playgrounds, et cetera. But, it's nice and you know, going out and just being outside and digging in the dirt and looking for bugs and having someone tell you about them. I mean, there are many things that are enriching, but few parents can do it without help. And parents working several jobs to make ends meet really need our help because they don't have the time often and the energy. High quality early childhood programs are needed and they are important, but finding care is hard as you know and the pandemic has made it even worse, especially in greater Minnesota here as well. So what beyond enrichment is important for this brain? This is a study by Joan Luby out of WashU. She looked at uh, families and looked at the variation in their income when the kids were three to five years of age and then she measured brain volume when they were six to ten. And families who had higher incomes, yes, their kids had larger brain volumes. But when she looked at parent education, she actually found those did connect. But when she added in harsh parenting and stress exposures, what she found is what was really doing the deed here was uh, that was actually reducing the size of this hippocampus, which is really sensitive to stress, was scary parenting or, and scary experiences and stress exposures in the family. So we got three things to target here, guys. We have enriching experiences and reducing um, stressful experiences. So what do I mean by stress? I want to make sure that we don't bubble wrap our children. There are positive stresses, getting frustrated, throwing a little temper tantrum, um, trying to ride a bike and falling off and scraping your knees. These are positive stresses. They activate your stress system, but you learn to regulate it. There's tolerable stresses. These are things we would prefer children, of course, did not experience. But if 
It ha the child has supportive, caring relationships to help him or her. You can actually learn to manage stress and even more stress. What we worry about is toxic stress. Prolonged activation of stress physiology in the absence of protective relationships or when those relationships are actually what's frightening you, which is really hard. To explain how this works, I'm showing you a cartoon of the brain. This green thing, and it's not green in your head, is the hippocampus. This is critically important for learning and memory. This is the amygdala, critically important for fear learning. And this region is that beautiful prefrontal cortex, planning, self-regulation, higher order reasoning. These regions are influenced by stress biology when it's activated. This is actually a neuron that could have come from the prefrontal cortex or from the amygdala. The top one here, where's my little cursor thingy, is a normal one. This is the nucleus. These are the connections that it can make. And this is one where we've actually just dumped on stress hormone, cortisol. It actually kills off the connections. If we look under, an, this is all under an electron microscope, if we look on these little processes, these little bumpy things, these are actually what synapses look like. That's without the stress hormone, this is with it. So what it's done is it's basically shrunk these neurons and reduced their connections. It's done it for a reason, to try to protect them because if they're sending too many signals, they sort of heat up too much and they can die, all right? So it's to protect them, but it, nonetheless, uh, if it's happening to a developing brain, can last for a very long period of time and you can't necessarily bounce back. These are data out of my lab. We've studied children who were uh, raised in orphanages under very deprived conditions and then are adopted into homes in Minnesota. This is a uh, looking when the kids are 12 to 13. They were typically adopted by age two to three. So many years they've been with their highly educated, highly resourced families here in Minnesota. These, uh, the left and right hippocampus volume, these are kids born and raised in Minnesota. These are kids adopted between four and 12 months of age, and these are kids adopted between a year and five years of age, most of them by three and a half. So this part of the brain was influenced more than likely by the lack of stimulation and the stress in the institution It hasn't come back. The families have helped them use what they have well, right? Um, but nonetheless, they're fighting harder to, to stay at the same place. Same the kids, this is the prefrontal cortex, and here we see even if you get adopted early. So this is probably reflecting prenatal stress to, uh, and lack of nutrition and so on. Okay, that was the prefrontal cortex and the uh, hippocampus where you're doing your thinking and reasoning. This is fear, the region where you do fear learning, and the way nature has it is this region under, under stress will become more connected. The reverse happens and it becomes more reactive. And this is some data that simply shows you this. If we show a picture of faces, the amygdala lights up to faces and lights up differently. It's showing more activity to different facial expressions, angry faces and especially fear faces if you've been raised in an institution and or are a child who's been in child protective services. Your brain has now really grasped onto that. So what has nature done? Under conditions of threat and deprivation, the brain becomes a brain that is better at acting now and thinking later, which is probably important for survival, but makes it really difficult. This is what we call trauma, right? This is the trauma-informed care process that we're trying to do in our schools, is understanding that a number of kids have had brains that have adapted to act now, think later, act defensively, think later, and how do we shift their experiences so they feel safe enough and so they can learn the regulation enough so that they can function well in school and spend a lot of time thinking now. Okay. So that's, I'm, not, I'm gonna save time and not go through the summary. You'll have it, hopefully you've got it. But what do we do? <laughs> well, we get it right the first time if we can because the basic principle of neuroscience is that creating the right conditions early will be more effective and less costly than addressing problems at later age. In terms of the brain, that's certainly true. It's easier to put it together than it is to try to compensate for it, and there are no do-overs. There's only compensation. 
you can't, you don't redo the brain. You provide ways of working around to be able, I mean, it takes, our brains are great at making us be capable of doing things that we are naturally doing, but it takes more effort and it's not as, uh, as uh, uh, reliable. I want to also finish here by saying this is all the downer part. I want to do the upper part of this talk, which is we can build resilience into our kids. Resilience is a dynamic process. The way we think about it, or one way to sort of think about it, is resilience is sort of like a teeter-totter, right? You have the teeter-totter, and you have the fulcrum here on where it's resting. And experiences may build up some negative things, right? We've been talking about the negative ones, which may ultimately tip your teeter-totter into poor outcomes. But the obvious thing is, if we can build up protective experiences for children, we can help to balance that teeth totter and, and deal with those negatives. So that's part of what you're talking about today. The other thing that I hope I've convinced you is experiences get built into the body. And so what is happening over time if we create positive experiences for our kids, we are essentially going to be able to move that fulcrum. We're going to be able to move the fulcrum to a point where a lot of, I mean, bad things happen in life. They happen throughout life. And if you're resilient, you can manage them without crumbling. And what we hope to be able to do with building these positive experiences is move that fulcrum so that we have children and we have many children and therefore a society in Minnesota where we can manage the challenges that are going to be coming at us, do so well and be resilient, um, have a resilient citizens agree. So I want to thank you. The recipe is adequate stimulation for the brain, early in development and on, reducing and eliminating toxic stress, increasing support and protective factors, and there are many ways we can do this. Some of it requires legislative action. Some of it requires neighbors getting together. Some of it requires just individuals noticing what's happening to the children and families around them and befriending their neighbors. So I want to thank you very much, and there's more information at these websites. Thank you, Dr. Gunner. I really appreciate it. Um, it does seem like there are many opportunities for us as legislators and policymakers to be taking action that we can um, work to build resilience in our, our youngest children. Members, do you have any questions? Um, Senator Westland? You. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for this presentation. <clears throat> I, uh, I'm a family law attorney, and we've actually been spending a lot of time talking about toxic stress and lifelong long impacts and how we can work to support families. And, and if people are interested in some other resources, um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris has done some remarkable work um, in community. Um, uh, she's written a book called The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Trauma and Adversity. There's a brilliant documentary called Resilience, the Biology of Stress and the Science of Hope. And then also, if you just go to TPT, they did a series called Whole People. Um, it was produced with uh, Centricare, and it goes over childhood trauma, including things that we can do in community to help support parents so that they can support children. Um, this is an important topic, and I, and I think that it is important for us as policymakers to take a trauma-informed approach when, when we are making policy to understand the long-term impacts um, for kids who have high ACEs scores, adverse childhood experiences, they have lifelong poor health outcomes. Diabetes, heart disease, um, uh, chemical dependency, uh, abuse, and so on. And so I appreciate you bringing this to us, and I would just encourage members um, that this is really getting to the heart of, of I think, what we need to be doing and, and viewing our policy making through this prism so that we can uh, help support individuals and communities. And the one thing about adverse childhood is experiences, it really did not test or, or look at impact for um, racism and, and other um, societal ills that I think would probably be adverse childhood experiences. So not so much a question, but a comment. I really appreciate this presentation. Thank you very much. Senator Wickman, thank you. may I respond? Um, yes, go ahead. Um, one of the things that I think is very, and I absolutely thank you, thank you for your, um, is we, this is a public health way we need to think. Not every individual who's had adverse experience is going to be in the toilet later on, 
okay? Um, you know, some people can smoke until they're 105 and say that that's how they live so long. As public policy makers, though, we are going to really increase the health of our society if we reduce these impacts and also if we increase the positive things to help balance the kinds of experiences. So thank you very much. Senator Kunish. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I remember back when um, I was studying, I was a teacher, and I remember going through early childhood and some of these um, health issues and the discussion around how important nutrition is at a very young age, um, especially around those neurons and, and myelin sheath um, always comes to mind. You know, we, we talk about um, keeping kids on a, on a good diet, a healthy diet, a balanced diet, but also the need to ensure that there are good fats and there are good proteins that are going in there um, for that early, early, early child um, brain development. Um, but one thing I wanted to just ask you about, or maybe you could comment on, um, when you talk about epigenetics and the, um, the long-lasting, the historic generational effects of trauma that, um, that, that change those genes um, in the parent, in the mother, when she experiences it, how that um, has been scientifically proven to be passed on to the next generation, and perhaps are we ever able to sort of erase that? Um, that that's my question. Dr. Thank Dr. you very much, Senator Wicklund, mm -hmm. and uh, Senator, I can't read it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, challenging. So the only way to prove it is not with people, but it has been with, with animal research because you have to control, you have to do what's called cross-fostering and um, do all these fancy dancy things. There is indeed evidence that if you have trauma to the mother during her early development and she carries a baby, that that baby, even if cross-fostered immediately to a non-traumatized rat mommy, will show the, the effects. Uh, will show some effects, uh, but less. And then in the next generation, you'll actually see some of it carry forward in certain brain regions. However, it is really difficult to show in humans. What we do have evidence of is that moms who have experienced a lot of adversity in their lives, when they are pregnant, will actually be producing different levels of stress hormone than moms who have not. And those stress hormones are able to talk to the fetus and may be part of some of those epigenetic changes. But it is something we can break. It's not going to have to happen, right? Because we can support women during their pregnancies, help them because they're also feeling anxiety and worry. And uh, you know, we can help them during their pregnancies and very likely change the womb, the chemical messages coming to that fetus in the womb. And also help the mother with her diet and, and, you know, and what gets to the baby. So there are things we can do. Um, and and uh, it's, it's not a given that it has to happen. It is part of what we can do as a society to support the people who are having the babies and raising the babies that will be paying our Social Security when we get even older. Thank you. Um, Senator Morrison? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for being here, Doctor. I always enjoy listening to you, and I'm so grateful for the work that you're doing for Minnesota and, frankly, for the whole country. Um, I love the concept of these joint hearings because I think it really demonstrates powerfully how none of these issues exist in isolation. Um, last year in the House, we had a really powerful um, joint hearing uh, between early childhood and public safety. I was really grateful to Chairs Pinto and Mariani for recognizing those connections and bringing us all together. I think a lot of people were taken aback at um, what a powerful crime prevention strategy investing in early childhood is. Um, so I just, I, I want to thank you for your work and, and for continuing to shout from the rooftops how important investing in the earliest years for our people and for our society is. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did, oh, Senator May Quayton. And then we'll, 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, my question was actually what Senator Kunish asked, so I appreciate you answering that question. And I think the only other question that I had was, you know, compared to other countries, what does the investment of this country look like in our youngest people? Like, what does that comparison look like? Thank you, Senator. I'm going to let Aaron probably comment next, on that. I don't want to steal his thunder, um, but it, we'll it's pitiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I don't see any other questions right now. Um, I thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. And we'll move to our next presenter, uh, Aaron Sojourner. Uh, and he is an economist and is from the W.E. Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. And I'll let him get his um, slides up on the screen. Welcome to the committees. And thank you very much for coming today. And please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how families with young children experience uh, the struggles of balancing dual responsibility of parenting and earning. Um, and try to communicate to you that as a society and as a community, we ask the most of families when they're least able to bear those burdens. Um, I work at the Upjohn Institute and also have an affiliation with the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota, where I was a professor. Um, so as uh, Dr. Gunner told you, income-based gaps in child skill open up early in life, but they're not inevitable. Uh, we ask the most of families when they have the least and the third point is that impacts of, you know, these things are not immutable. Impacts of early childhood investments can be very high, and they can generate high rates of return uh, on investments, higher than the private sector in, in many cases. So this just extends some of the stuff that um, Dr. Gunner was talking about. If you look on the horizontal, this is years of children's age. If you look at the blue line, you can see this is uh, from when kids are zero, when they're first able to measure um, child skill, cognitive skill, uh, sort of at age one, at age two, you can see the scores of kids from the highest income fifth of families. And the orange line shows you the scores of kids uh, from the lowest income families. And what you see is that they start off pr pretty close but like many of the graphs uh, Dr. Gunner showed, this gap opens up across the first five years of life to be pretty wide by the time kids enter kindergarten. And what you also should note is that once you get to K-5 system, the gap stops growing, basically. Um, and it's pretty stable at that point. So we see this relationship between family income, family background, and um, kids' development, their skills, their capacities. They are, there's a lot of evidence uh, that they are due to child, differences in child's early experiences, and if we change those experiences, we can break those relationships. So uh, this is a study I did um, a decade ago now uh, based on an experiment that ran um, before that, uh, where it looked at kids, it recruited families who were giving birth to kids in hospitals, kids who were low birth weight and premature in eight hospitals around the country, uh, over a thousand kids. Uh, and it gave, it ran, these are all the, there were some high income families, some low income families, uh, and it, within each set of families, they randomly assigned some kids to get access to three years of services, a year of home visiting, followed by two years of access to free, full-day, high-quality care. So about the control group didn't get access to those things. The treatment group did. And there's nothing systematically different about the control group or the treatment group, except did they get access to these services or not? Uh, so like genetics, the same. Uh, Family income, the same. Neighborhood, the same. All the factors you think about are the same, except did they have access to these high-quality care services and home visiting? 
at the end of the first year, among the low-income kids, there was a kind of a small effect on kids' uh, cognitive skill. But the, when the kids turned one, they started having access to this high-quality care center. And uh, at age two, there was just a massive effect on kids' uh, cognitive skills. So that's 1.3 standard deviations of IQ. That's, that means that the kids from low-income families had IQ scores that were above just like regular kids from middle-income families who didn't have access, the control group kids in the other. So like the achievement gap was gone, right? The kids from low-income families who had access to these great services were doing just as well as any, the average kid in the community. And two, at age three, two, after two years of services, the gap, the uh, treatment effect was even bigger, like 1.6. That's like 22 IQ points or something. Uh, again, nothing systematically different about the treatment and control, just did they have access to these services. The whole thing ended at age three. When the kids turned three, they lost access to everything. And I want to ask you, what do you think happened after that? So like... Uh, they still followed these kids um, many years later. When the kids entered kindergarten, the effect on IQ had faded down, but it was still really big. It was still 0.6 standard deviations, so like 10 IQ points. The kids were carrying into uh, kindergarten much higher cognitive skills, much higher capacities to think and learn um, if they had access to these high quality early experiences. Uh, even five years later, even 15 years later, there were no measurable differences in the kids' skills from things that happened, you know, 15 years before. Uh, that's kids from low-income families. For kids from higher-income families, um, you know, we can also do the same exercise and see what the effects were. Um, they were much, they were positive, um, but they were much smaller, and they did fade out and fade away. Basically, so this gives us a clue that what really matters is like changing the early experiences of kids, and especially kids who um, maybe don't have access to the most enriching environments uh, when they're young. Um, and there's been a whole series of work by uh, Jim Heckman and Art Rolnick. I'm sure many of you have heard from him in the past. Uh, Heckman is a Nobel laureate uh, economist at the University of Chicago in the economics department. He did a study, he's done a bunch of studies around the economic returns to early childhood investments. This is one of the more famous ones. Uh, this is a table from that paper. If you look in the bottom right at the set of numbers I've put in a square there, you can see these are, he calculates the internal rate of return to investments in high quality uh, early care and education services for kids from disadvantaged families in this study. And what that means is, again, think about an investment. What's an investment? It's something where you pay a um, cost up front and then you get a stream of benefits down the road, right? So if you're a business and you're thinking about investing uh, in a new piece of plant machinery, you know, you have to pay for the machinery up front, but then it's going to deliver a stream of productive benefits down the road. And you, if you're a business person, you take out your pencil and your calculator, you figure out like what's the rate of return on that investment. If I uh, put up this money into this machine, it's gonna deliver a rate of return based on how much it costs me now and how much benefits it delivers into the future. You can do the same thing with early childhood investments or any kind of public investment. You can say, okay, look, we have to pay $1,000 now, $10,000 now, but it's going to change the trajectory of someone's life, and let's see how that trajectory changes and what the costs and benefits are into the future. So let's look at how does it affect special education services in K-12? How does it affect grade retention? How does it affect criminal justice involvement? How does it affect social benefit use in adulthood? How does it affect earnings and employment in adulthood? And, you know, you can take a time discount 
on that stream of benefits. Uh, and what you get, what Heckman, the Nobel laureate, got was that the rate of return, something like 8, 9, 10, 12%. Rolnick and Grunewald did it. They got higher numbers even. But I want to, so that's like investing in ki kids' high quality early childhood experiences delivers a rate of return conservatively like 8% in this study. I want you to like think about, okay, that's one use of our resources. We could put it into those kids' experiences. There are other uses we could make of those resources. We could leave them in the private economy. We could let, you know, keep taxes lower and let the private sector do its thing. And what returns is that going to generate? If you look at the returns to the stock market since World War II, the rate of return is about 6%, actually a little less than 6%. So that's what kind of the private economy delivers in terms of returns. 8% is higher than 6%. You get higher returns from investing in this program. It's not to say every early childhood dollar invested uh, will deliver that return. Um, you know, it matters a lot, the quality. It matters a lot, the population. But I want to uh, also tell you that, like, this is 8%, 6%. Those sound pretty close, but... Uh, counterintuitively, because of the way exponential growth works, 8% is a lot more than double 6% in terms of returns. So uh, if, you, you know, if you invest a dollar now and you wait 50 years, if you get zero return, you still have a dollar at the end. If you get a 6% return, you have about $20 at the end. If you get an 8% return, you actually end up with like $50 at the end. So even though eight and six sound very close, uh, it's actually a huge difference, and it generates a lot of benefits. Um, this, so that's my, um, the first point I wanted to say. The second point is we ask the most of families when they have the least. Uh, families have the least private resources early in their kids' lives when they're, when they're parenting young children. Instead of compensating for that, public policy reinforces that and also invests the least resources early in kids' lives. It does not make the situation better. It makes it worse. Uh, and that means that families have the most private responsibility early, and then we make it much better for them later on. So if you think about families, when your kids are young, you're young. You've had less time to work and, save and earn and save. Um, so you have less savings from past income. If you look at wages or potential wages as a function of how old your kid is, that's what the blue bars are showing you. When your kids are zero to two, um, parents tend to have wages that are about 8% less than their average wage during their children's uh, time that they're at home. And their wage gets higher uh, across as their children age because they gain more experience, more education, promotions, pay raises. So like your past income is lower, your current earning power is lower. And you, it's true, you do have higher future income, but you have less access to future income. So when your kids are young, you tend to have lower credit scores than when your kids are older. So you have less, even though you do have more future income, you have less access to it, less ability to borrow. So families are very credit constrained, liquidity constrained. They know that they want to invest in their kids, but they can't come up with the resources. Because if you think about a family with private resources, what are all the kinds of resources? Well, there's past, there's present, and there's future. That's all the kinds of private resources. And families have less past, present, and access to future resources when their kids are younger than when their kids are older. So families have the least when their kids are younger. Public policy reinforces this. So if you look across, this is from a report I did uh, a couple years ago at Brookings at Hamilton, and this adds up all public investments, state, federal, local, 
early childhood, education, health, nutrition, housing, everything. <coughs> Sorry about that. All, all public spending. And it breaks it out by kids' age. And what you see is that we invest across all kinds of programs the least when kids are youngest and sort of the most when they're sort of early education. And just for comparison, I put, you, know, you can put in there how much do we spend on seniors. And we spend you know, something like $7,000, $8,000 a year per kid when they're zero to two. Uh, we spend about 32000 per senior per year uh, between Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, other things like that. Um, if you just focus on care and education programs, so forget about Medicare, um, medical spending, housing, nutrition, just focus on care and education. This is the national statistics. The Minnesota statistics I've calculated look very similar to this. Uh, in the first three years of kids' lives, we invest about $500 per child per year. If you look at Head Start, you look at uh, CCDBG, CC, the CCAP program here in Minnesota, you look at um, state you know, pre-K programs, you look at all the ways that we spend money on care and education, it's about $500 per child per year in the first three years. In the next two years, it goes up to about $2,500. Once kids hit age five, and for the next 13 years after that, we spend close to $15,000 per child per year. So there's this real imbalance tilted towards older ages in public investments. And consequently, like families have a very heavy care burden when their kids are young and what this graph shows you is time use, kid, the um, share of time that kids spend in publicly financed care by their age. So the younger ages are at the bottom, older ages at the top. And look at the orange and yellow. That's, those are the two types of care that are publicly financed. And if you look at the blue and the gray and the green, those are uh, care those are uh, time and settings that the family is paying for, either providing the care directly or paying, bu buying the care. Children spend only about five hours a week, on average, outside their parents uh, uh, in a publicly financed care setting um, in the first few years of life. They only spend about 20 hours a week uh, altogether out of their parents' care. That means they spend about 148 hours a week in their parents' care. Um, that's a, that's a, a substantial care responsibility that we lighten very substantially once kids hit age five and six. You might say, well, maybe it's easy to take care of young kids. Maybe it's cheaper. We don't need so much resources. But that's not the case. Uh, you know, I taught at the Carlson School for many years. I had 100 students in my class. I could take care of them all and teach them all. They were pretty autonomous. They're master students. They're pretty self-sufficient, capable people. Try that with an infant classroom. It's not going to work, right? Like You can only divide the adult's time not very much. Uh, so it's pretty expensive. There's no way out of early childcare being expensive because there's no way to produce it without an adult and there's no way you can divide that adult's time finely enough to make it cheap. So there's not enough private resources, there's not enough public resources, and there's a huge like um, requirement for an adult to be in care with these kids. What else could we possibly expect to happen if families don't have the resources to finance this? The public is not putting in resources to finance it. You get a set of predictable crises, shortages, lack of care, high turnover, low pay. And I want to just say uh, the next speaker is going to talk about the workforce. But as a labor economist, I'll just throw this out. If you look nationally, uh, 
the average childcare worker makes less than the average parking lot attendant. We pay people more to watch cars than to watch the next generation. The average dog walker makes more than the average childcare worker. Uh, we pay them more to pay, watch our pets. Part of that's because we can divide it very finely, right? Like one person can watch a lot of cars. One person can watch a lot of dogs. We can't play that trick with kids. Like that is quality and that has, uh, so there's limits to how far we can push that. Uh, so there's a whole predictable set of crises uh, that follow. Uh, following up on Senator May, Quaid, May Quaid's question uh, earlier, yeah, especially in the first few years of life, America spends about $500 per child per year. Many other countries are spent, are investing you know, uh, 10, 20 times that. Um, there was an article in the New York Times a couple years ago that did a comparison. I can forward it to you if you like. Um, so early, care, early experiences have lifelong consequences. This is really like a once in a lifetime investment opportunity and our communities are, and families are suffering because there's an investment sh shortage. Like families don't have the resources to invest, especially the most disadvantaged families. And um, that's why the returns are so high is because there's a credit constraint. Like the private sector doesn't crowd in to uh, invest here because the benefits are shared broadly across the whole community when you have a functional adult in the community. They're a benefit to the employer, they're a benefit to their neighbor, they're a benefit to their family uh, and their uh, church or synagogue or, or um, uh, and you know, so we ask the most of families when they have the least and uh, these things are susceptible to policy improvement. Uh, also it can increase parents' labor market participation, which many employers are excited about, uh, too. So I'll leave you there with uh, Frederick Douglass and Alfred Marsh. Thank you very much. That's really um, informative, and I appreciate your putting it in terms and, and visually so we can see, um, see the differences in investment. Um, I appreciate the additional slides that are in, the, in your um, presentation that we um, can all review. I will call attention to the last slide that does kind of break down how much does, how much public investment annually is Minnesota providing by age and income. So that, that might be informative to members as you, yeah. as you think about, you know, our investments and how much we are investing. Um, do members have any questions? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to the testifier and the information. When I'm looking at the one of the first graphs you have uh, provided in the slides, the parent income with the blue on the top and the orange on the bottom, yeah. do you have any data in regards to other thing, other variables, other factors, other externalities that influence families beyond just income. For example, crime, crime rate. Yeah. Families that are in higher crime areas versus families that are not. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, I'm you know in, in the previous test fire, I was thinking of the effect of there are uh, healthy stressors, there are unhealthy stressors that have an impact on brain development, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great Mr. question. Sojourner. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Senator. Um, you're absolutely right that income is just like one marker that we can use, but it actually marks a big cluster of differences between families. So it's not just family income. It's also, um, yeah, a lot of things go along with being from a high-income family or a, low, a lower-income family. Like, there's a whole cluster of of experiences and opportunities and challenges um, in terms of the neighborhood, the, the family, the background, the, you know, all kinds of factors. And I don't mean to claim that income is the thing that matters and those other things don't matter. It's just a way of grouping 
you know, to see that there are these inequalities that develop, and they, all those uh, things you mentioned do matter, um, and they all show up in that difference. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I appreciate that. I appreciate the, the acknowledgement that there are other factors. Because the brain development, child uh, skill development uh, is an incredibly complex area. And one of the things that I'm thinking back many, many years when I was first going to school for police officer, uh, it was a kind of a, a tongue-in-cheek joke, but they said uh, it is a fact that ice cream sales increase or decrease, I should say, no, increase in the summer. Uh -huh. Ice cream sales increase in the summer, that's a fact. Sure. It is also a fact that crime increases in the summer months right. versus winter months. So therefore, we can conclude <laughs> that the increased sales right. of ice cream is a cause and effect yeah. that impacts the increase in crime. And clearly, that's not the case. There's a correlation there. Right. The correlation between both of those is another variable not being mentioned. It's the temperature, right? Yeah. And so... One of the things that I'm thinking about is, so this graph, I just want members to, and I'm, I'm sure all of us are understanding that, there may be a correlation, but it's not a cause and effect between income. Crime is huge, and I'm thinking about variables of families that have children that are trapped in high crime areas, and the stressors that creates day by day, week by week, year by year on children in these younger ages and in even above, and how that has an, a negative impact on intelligence potentially because of the stressors we heard in the brain development, uh, et cetera. Another one that uh, is very uh, important, I think, there's a host of research out there that I think definitively concludes that two parent family homes are the most beneficial for the development of children. And I think, that's another uh, topic that isn't often discussed, is that it is, a more, it is more of a challenge to raise children in a single family home. That's, that's a fact. And so these variables all go into to children's development. So is income a metric? Absolutely. But is it a cause and effect? I don't think so. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Slaughter. So on that first graph, I told you that this is income and it's descriptive. But in, this, in the next bit of, that's why I showed you the next bit of evidence, which was from a random controlled trial. And so there, what I'm telling you is that if you take two kids, if you take kids from single parent families, low income families, and you randomly assign some of them to have access to high quality care in the first couple years of their lives, it changes the trajectory of their life. It increases the capacity uh, their capacity to learn and, and function. And that is a causal thing, and that is not just correlation. Also, the fact that it's correlated doesn't prove that it's causal, but it also doesn't prove it's not causal. Like it, it is, it, there is other evidence that shows income does uh, affect. Um, so these are complicated processes, and they do have a lot of, uh, um, there's not one s single variable that matters. Um, yeah. um, I do have other people who have questions. One well, last follow-up. Nope, not even a question, just a, a follow-up. So yeah, on that note, you know, there, again, it's very complex, and there are a lot of variables to life. And so when, you know, there are, it's, it could be a, a, a possibility of the scenario, uh, such as you're suggesting the, the uh, subsequent graphs to that one is that in a two-parent family home, there is a, a potentially greater opportunity to provide healthy stimulation uh, because there's more time bandwidth than in a single family or potentially an absent father from a child's life. And when the single family or a single parent family has less opportunity to provide that healthy stimulation. So that's an example how the root in this particular hypothetical I'm providing is one parent versus two parent. That's also going to have a, a connection to obviously fa a household income, one parent versus two parent. But it's going to have, again, a greater impact and a greater influence on the, the bandwidth to spend healthy time with the child in that nurturing and very important early years. So 
again, Madam Chair, my, my whole point is it's complex. I know that the members of this committee, I know everybody on, in part of this conversation understands that. It's just there's a lot that goes into this, and I don't want us to be pulled off track into thinking people with more money have better children, people with less money uh, have lack or less opportunity to produce uh, high skill uh, and great brain development children. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I, I think that, thank you for your point. I, I do think that our public investment and our, our ability to change policy and, and make investments, I think that's what I'm reflecting on um, here. We have the ability to influence that and um, based on the, the information we're provided, we can see that there is a, a trajectory for kids that we can have an impact on. Senator May Quaid. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and you know, just I wouldn't want to suggest that the you know 10 million children who might have lost a loved one parent during COVID um, are in somehow worse dire straits to become great adults either, especially for single parents who might be in the audience or on this committee. Um, but I do know that there was a point in American history when we did have universal child care, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the outcomes of that generation of kids who had access to quality care and and their parents who who were able to work. Do you have, and, and if you don't have that data, that's okay, but I know that we did have that at one point. Mr. Sojourner? Yeah, I think maybe you're referring to Chris Earps uh, has done study of this program that passed during World War II, um, that a federal program that um, invested in early care and education experiences for um, wor workers and communities, because there was such a labor shortage. Mm -hmm. You know, there were so many soldiers overseas and we also needed so many people working in the factories to produce um, that there was a big investment in early childhood uh, care experiences. And he used um, variation in that investment to compare kids uh, who grew up like right before that investment was made to the kids who were uh, in the communities where those investments were made uh, and then after the uh, investment stopped being made um, and compare them to other communities where no investment was made. And what he found was that, yeah, there was, you could see effects in the labor market in terms of higher earnings, higher employment, many decades later that, you know, even into when people were 50 and 60 years old, average wages were higher, earnings were higher. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just I think that's really important to note that we have evidence that the policy that we make, you know, we can't legislate uh, marriages and family relationships, but we can legislate around the investments we make in these child care systems. And I think that's really important to note. We have evidence that it has worked and will work. Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to, um, I heard some things about um, two-parent households and, and single parents. And I just want to make sure that this is, this is recorded, this is documented, and we have an expert in the room. I want to maybe sort of send a message and ask for you to, uh, you know, talk about the facts that sometimes it is um, better for a child to be in a household that doesn't have two parents if it's not stable or healthy or safe. Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how I think I don't want any single parents out there to feel as if they are you know, doomed because maybe they don't have the same resources as people with two parents, um, and maybe the resources and support can be offered or statistics or some um, scientific uh, way to sort of back up that um, single parents can offer a stable and enriching life for their children as well. Mr. Sojourner. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, I mean, I, I, children having access to the kind of stable and supportive relationships and care experiences, that's what our best evidence of what helps promote uh, healthy development and resilient adults and productive adults in the community. And those experiences often come from parents and you know, parents drive a lot of kids' experiences. They don't have to necessarily, like grandparents, other family, um, neighbors, friends, professional caregivers, like can all supply better or worse experiences, you know, for kids. And the fact is like each kid only has one childhood and whatever they live through, that's gonna, if 
affect the next 60, 70 years of their lives and how they are as neighbors and producers in, in, the, in the economy. So, um, and again, we've seen positive impacts of investments that improve kids' experiences from every type of family. It, you know, it, it really is the experience the kids have that matter. And good and bad experiences might tend to come more from one kind of place or community or family but uh, than others. It's harder to produce um, those experiences with less resources. Um, but uh, you can do it, you know, given resources and given um, stable, supportive en environment and, and uh, parenting or, or caregiving, you know, uh, kids can grow and flourish wherever they come from. And I think, again, that's what that random control trial showed, is that even kids born low birth weight, premature, uh, kids born into families with very low incomes, many single parent families, having access to this high quality care experiences just for a few years early in their life had long term uh, impacts, made long term improvements. And it wasn't differences in genetics, it wasn't differences in family structure, it wasn't differences, uh, it was, you know, f for whatever those circumstances were, they did better. Anything else? Senator Weslin, and then, I'm, I'm, then we'll move forward to our next presentation. Thank Senator you, Madam Weslin. Chair. I will try to, is my mic on? I will try and keep this somewhat brief, but um, uh, I have a comment and a question. Um, so, so my experience as a family law attorney and some of the continuing education we've had over the years is that um, when parents um, separate, whether they're married or unmarried, when they are no longer together, um, my understanding of the statistics is generally speaking, the standard of living for um, the, typically the mother and the child goes down precipitously while the standard of living um, for the male member of the family goes up precipitously. And so I think when we're talking again about correlation and causation, um, I think we have to be careful about this, what is the circumstance causing the stressors for the child? And we heard a lot about toxic stress. And as Senator Gustafson noted, it is not necessarily um, that parents are separating that is the source of toxic stress for, for kids. My experience has been it's when parents are unable to effectively co-parent afterwards, they're in a high conflict dynamic and relationship, that that is the thing that creates toxic stress for kids. When one parent um, experiences um, poverty or um, considerable financial stress, that that also plays out for kids. But to, but to tie this all back to our first presentation, is that kids can receive support and development of resilience from any loving, well-regulated adult, and that that can actually mitigate the impact of ACEs and toxic stress on kids. And so what I'm understanding from the first presentation and from your presentation is, if we can intervene early and we can make some investments to support kids and families and help them develop that resilience that we actually, that those investments actually save us money, not only save us money in the future, but actually um, reduce the investments that have to be laid, made later on, but also those are individuals who will be able to contribute more fully. Do I have that right? That sounds right. Uh, Mr. Sojourner. Yeah, the, I agree with uh, that characterization, yeah. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really very informative. Now I'd like to move to uh, a presentation about the early care and education, kind of the, the system we have, and why is it challenging for our system to um, be able to provide access for families to high quality care, and uh, why is it unaffordable for parents to access high quality care and education um, experiences, and what are some of the 
the economic <coughs> factors that are, are um, happening today in our current system. And we have uh, three experts in this area, and I really appreciate your coming today. Um, Ann McCulley and Nancy Jost and Jamie Bonchick. And I, I will let you start, um, uh, Ms. McCulley, if you could introduce yourself yes, for the record. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Senator, and thank you to the committee. This is, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to go extremely quickly. Um, I have to start by saying that uh, Dr. Gunner and um, Mr. Sojourner set us up perfectly for a lot of what we want to then share. Um, my name is Ann McCulley. I am, my day job is Executive Director of Child Care Aware of Minnesota, but I'm here in the capacity as a co-facilitator for a group called Transforming Minnesota's Early Childhood Workforce. Uh, we are a group that formed in 2016 in response to the National Transforming the Early Childhood Workforce Report and had the honor of working with the National Academies to start to identify strategies from that report we could implement in Minnesota. And we sort of have haven't looked back. <laughs> so here we are. And my co-facilitator, Nancy, is going to talk a little bit more about the picture in Minnesota. I'm going to do a very even faster than planned high-level overview. And I really want to save time for Jamie to show. I think Jamie's here as a either case study or cautionary tale about why it's so important. Um, I will just say right now, as I speed through these, that um, the Great Start Task Force, which I'm a little worried we aren't going to have time. I, I served on that, had the pleasure of serving on that task force with both Senators Wicklin and Bolden. And um, we're presenting the problem and the crisis. I will just say in case we run out of time, I think there are some amazing and wonderful solutions in that report and hopefully we'll have time to look at it. I'm not going to dwell on these two pages because really, again, the last two presenters made these points better than I possibly could. I think what, and you've got the presentation, but we know that this is an in, incredibly important um, industry. We call it the workforce behind the workforce um, in terms of our current and especially now uh, during this economy. We need child care in particular and early education to support our working families. Um, and we also know that this is based on Dr. Gunner's presentation, um, the starting point for the healthy lives of so many of our young children. What I want to start with is though that if we, if we truly embrace and believe those two concepts that the, those early years are so incredibly important for the health and development of our children and that we know families are not in a position to pay uh, because of all the things Dr. Mr. Sojourner sh shared with you, um, then the system we currently have does not match. It is fundamentally broken. Um, right now, the way that we finance that system um, is, is layered program funding from many different programs. There is not, uh, often it follows a particular audience. Um, I am always amazed by our child care centers and family child care programs in particular who figure out ways to braid and blend a myriad of funding streams. Um, often that funding does not reflect or support the importance of quality care and the cost that comes with sustaining quality. And of course, as you well know, and we'll talk more about Minnesota, compensation, you, Mr. Sojourn just said it better than I could, is incredibly low and has been a perennial issue in this field. And again, the burden is on families. Um, this is just a quick graphic out of the second report from the National Academies, which was about transforming the financing of early childhood. I didn't plug the numbers into this one. We do have numbers specifically for Minnesota because frankly, it's an overwhelming number for most folks, but it is a necessary um, uh, construct. This is just really to illustrate the fact that if we truly were going to do all the things we just talked about, that is the gap in funding we would need to really fully help parents at the cost that they can afford, make sure it's quality care and make sure we're compensating our workforce. And I guess I'd call out three things, that the gap is large, that even of the funding that is currently there, over half of it is borne by families who, again, do not necessarily have the income that they that they're going to have later in life, certainly, um, and that uh, basically that a lot of people over on the right-hand side of that graph are being left out. I'm just going to quickly run through two or three um, graphics for you. And one of the things that happens to me a lot in my job at Child Care Aware, um, our national office every year publishes a report, used to be called the cost of child care. Now it's called the price of child care because quite honestly, what it measures is what programs are charging. It doesn't really get at what the true cost of care is. But either way, it's always a sticker shock moment. And we always get questions about, I don't understand why it's so expensive. And then these staff get paid so low. And so this is just to try to explain to you that Again, most of the cost of running, and I've got one on family child care in a moment, this is centers, is staffing costs. And as you've already heard, it has to do with the fact that, again, yes, we don't want one teacher watching 100 
cars or children, and especially with our youngest ages. Ideally, you want one teacher with three children, three infants, rather. So infants, um, toddlers gets a little bit larger, but all in all, across all those ages, what Dr. Gunner talked about, the importance of that serve and return. We really need to make sure that those ratios are low. That costs money, it costs a lot of money. Um, there's a lot of other things that go into programs, if you think about it. Obviously, food, um, <laughs> residency, um, uh, lease or, or rent, um, all the costs that go in running any kind of other business. And of course, we all know what those costs have done in this last year. Um, I, I meant to say at the beginning, a lot. if I had done this presentation two, two years ago or three years ago, right before COVID, a lot of this would have been the same picture. It's only gotten worse and become more glaring. Um, so this is just an example of a typical child care center serving 57 children in greater Minnesota. Even if they're uh, at 85% of capacity, they often are seeing a loss. For those, again, who like pictures, this is, I think, a helpful construct. This comes out of the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment. I believe they use 2018 data. Um, but it's just kind of taking a, a mathematical look at trying to help you understand, again, if even though we might have parents paying an average of $10,000, if this is a center that's open 10 hours a day, serves 40 children, once you take out the average cost for things like rent, utilities, maintenance, I would add food is in there under materials and administration, you're left with about basically $260,000. And if you look at the bubbles at the top, you've got to use $260,000 to pay a director, three lead teachers, and six assistant teachers. I think you can all do the math pretty quickly to understand why we have people making so little money. And we can't charge parents more. So instead, and this is what you'll see in the Great Start Report, we need to think about this differently. We need a system that looks at this early education as a public good. Because again, child care is the largest household cost for many families. The average early educator is still making under $12 an hour, or right around $12 an hour, and this is 2018. Um, about half nationally of our early educators rely on public assistance themselves, and you'll see some statistics in a minute from Minnesota. Um, many of those then, consequently, are worrying about even keeping their own families safe and, and fed. And um, the importance of having an early childhood workforce that is not only qualified, educated, skilled to do all the things that Dr. Gunner was talking about, but is also not so stressed worrying about their own families is key. And many of our people working in early childhood do not have access to benefits. So when we say compensation, we're not just talking about wages, we're talking about all the other things that go into what we call compensation, benefits, time for planning, paid sick time, health care. So teacher turnover, which we'll talk about in a minute, is also high and we really need a system that supports children's, or sorry, staff, our workforce livelihood. Just quickly then, because I get this question, um, what about family child care? Yes, the cost centers are different. Most of our family child care uh, folks are single operators, but there then you're dealing with occupancy and food and transportation, all the things on that grid. And again, this is 2016 data. There is a new study going on right now to look at the costs of child care in this new time, but this is the best data I could find that's you know, relatively close. And this was a small snapshot of family child care homes. Average annual expenses were 26,000, just over 26,000. Average annual revenue, 50,000. So again, net gain of 24,000. And I'm here to tell you, and they will tell you themselves, most family child care providers are not working only 40 hours a week. So it's less than $12 an hour. The last thing I'm going to say, and then I really want to quickly hand it over to Nancy, is I do want to give one light of hope, which I, I again, our organization has been providing for three years now, the technical assistance for the various grants. First it was the peacetime emergency grants, the public health grants, but most notably these child care stabilization grants. And I know your, both your committees heard the bill to extend those, those payments through June, which we're grateful for. Um, we're hearing it day in, day out. These are life-saving amounts of money, as tiny as they might be. It is keeping doors open. And I just want to point out that the other thing it's done, it's the first time, and I've been at this for 21 years, and I'm kind of a newbie compared to some folks behind me, um, but it's the first time I've ever seen us do something systemic, meaning everybody's got access to it as long as they're operating in good standing. Um, and it goes to the programs directly. Many of our constructs, not to downplay those, they're incredibly important, but they follow the family and the parent so those can come and go. This is straightforward payments to the programs to sustain and keep their doors open. 
And I will say furthermore, it's the first time we've had any kind of focus on compensation. We're back to that very big puzzle. So 70% of the current grants have to be spent in some way, shape, or form on compensation. Looks different for family child care than center, but the idea of paying yourself then as a family child care provider. And that is such an important nod. So I just wanted to call that out, and I know that's going to be on the, on the horizon. I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Jost, who's going to talk then a little bit about why compensation in Minnesota um, basically doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members. I am Nancy Jost. I work for West Central Initiative, one of the six Minnesota Initiative Foundations based in Fergus Falls. And I'm also the um, co-chair with Anne for Transforming the Workforce. So the first thing I want to say is that I would really like to encourage us in Minnesota to remember the child care workforce in our policies to support children and families. Children and families need child care. And child care really is the workforce, the people who are caring for and educating the children. The slides are going to show you a lot of evidence um, that people are not making enough money in early care and education. So compensation does not even meet the basic cost of living. Um, there is a turnover rate of at least 14% for child care providers. And as you can see the, on the right, the cost of living for a single person um, is $15.85 an hour. Child care providers and educators make anywhere between $11 and $16 an hour. Another um, slide to um, evidence that child care educators are not making enough money. 19% of them are at or below the poverty level compared to 2% of all Minnesota workers. Approximately a third of the early childhood workforce in Minnesota receives public support. So we are paying for the low compensation one way or the other in Minnesota. In 2018, the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment out of Berkeley did a study called SEQUEL. It stands for Supportive Environmental Quality Underlying Adult Learning. It's really about um, the environments that people work in. And uh, they, the study um, included 47 centers. 33 were parent-aware rated. 14 were not. There were 18 centers that were studied in urban settings and 29 in rural. And really, the uh, and then there were 99% um, of the people who um, did the survey were women. And you have to wonder um, when we have 99% of the workforce in early care and education being women, is that one of the reasons that the pay is so poor? So some of the studies again just show evidence of why we um, have a shortage. The compensation is abysmal. Um, people who are doing this often do not have health insurance. They don't have benefits, time off, retirement. Who wants to, who wants to work in those conditions? And then um, not only that, but while they're working, they're worrying about paying for their own health care costs, their family's monthly bills, paying house, housing costs, paying for enough food for their own family. And again, we wonder why there is a child care shortage. And then there's the pipeline. And because of all the things we just, um, just talked about, because of the low pay, few people want to go into the field. And because of that, fewer and fewer colleges are providing an early childhood degree. So that is kind of depressing. But the thing that's so exciting about all of this is there is hope, and we know what to do. We need to help make sure that the people who are doing early care and education, who are mostly women, make a wage that is worthy of the job we are expecting them and needing them to do in our society. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, Ms. Bonchik, please uh, introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, and you have to be fairly yeah. close to these microphones. Okay. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, uh, my name is Jamie, thank you, Madam Chair and the committee. My name is Jamie Bonzik. Professionally, I work at Greater Twin Cities United Way, leading an initiative called 80 by 3, 80% of brain development by the age of three, leading trauma-sensitive care in early ed. I'm here to speak about an unfortunate wisdom. Ah. So what we heard in the previous um, education testimony is what is predictable is preventable. And unfortunately, even if we have heard from brain architects and uh, research scientists and labor economists, unfortunately, people are massively leaving our field. And in 2019, I had to close a high quality program dedicated to the wages and benefits and workplace environment. Because what we know about young children is that the adult's environment is their learning environment. And we dedicated ourselves to this for 39 years. And unfortunately, we lost a lease that helped to subsidize the cost of what it took to pay for professional educators who were dedicated to supporting families and communities. And if you can go, so when we looked to relocate that facility, what we found was that in a good year, we might have had a 1% um, profit, which a 1% profit in early childhood would lead to about $20,000. And that doesn't leave you enough of a buffer for when you need to prepare for any kind of crisis. And unfortunately, in early childhood, even before the pandemic, it always feels like a crisis. So looking at a projected loss of $260,000 a year, we couldn't balance the scale to stay open. But I opened the books for you to look at real numbers. And when we look at some of these costs, they're higher than others. But when I look at some things like training and quality, the reason you can see that it was only $14,000 is because these people had been with us for 20 to 30 years. Excuse me. And when we bring up some of the things in this room, like community violence, or adverse childhood experiences, or adverse community experiences, this particular community was not experiencing those. And when we look at the budgets needed to actually provide trauma-sensitive, culturally relevant, and culturally congruent care to affect brain development and nervous system regulation for healthy outcomes and positive life outcomes, it costs more than this. And so if you can go to the last slide, unfortunately, the loss to this particular community was 117 high quality spaces for infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, and 21 experienced staff that left. Before the pandemic, I had 32 staff. At, at the end of the pandemic, I had retained 21 all the way to the end. Unfortunately, many of those experienced educators left the field completely because they could not find another work environment that supported them professionally and personally in the way that we were able to contribute to their own livelihoods. Because as we heard from Dr. Gunner, we're talking about a two-generation approach. Two-generation in early childhood includes the educators, not only families, because often our educators are also our families. And so when I look at these people who I've stayed in contact with that haven't left the field and they've stayed, many of them have already been since we closed in December of 2020, uh, excuse me, in December of 2019, they're on their second or third employment opportunity because they're still seeking a long-term home. That isn't good for the field and it isn't good for families and it really isn't good for children and the environments and the attachment that they need to have people and environments that show to them that they belong and that they are worthy. And one other thing that I heard, and, and I'm going to put this together in a way that we would say it in early childhood, is in early childhood, the environment is the third teacher. And so, yes, it's important that we have high quality relationships, but it is also important that where children are in these relationships, tell them that they are important and that they're worthy and that they see the adults in their lives being treated such, whether those are caregivers or their family or the educators in their lives. It is telling them a tale that they will keep with them for life. 
Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate all of the presenters, and thank you, Jamie, for sh sharing your story. Um, it's it's frustrating and challenging when we when we know what to do, but we aren't able to do it. So, I really appreciate your coming today, um, Senator Uma Verbaten. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just wanted to say thank you for your testimony. Your passion for um, our youngest people is just very evident, and many of us share that up here. It's it's really shameful the lack of investment um, that this legislature has has put into our youngest people, and it it impacts all the other work that we're doing here. Um, so thank you for your work and. I'm certainly committed to doing better. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I also wanted to thank you for your testimony. I have an eight-month-old, and we lost her primary teacher to lens crafters. Mm -hmm. And she started going there when she was three months old, which is so hard as her mom. And, um, you know, I was nervous that she was going to cry all day and be really sad. And she was for like a week. And then she was fine. And then she had to do it all over again when her teacher left. And, you know, we pay $2,000 a month in child care fees. I would pay more if I could, but we can't afford to. And the other parents feel the same way. We love this child care center. But it is like they, they just can't do any more than they're already doing. And so, um, like, you just, you really, taught, you really brought home that emotion because, like, I think sometimes we think about people leaving the profession, like, oh, my favorite person who worked at Target, like, got a new job and they left. But, like, these are the attachments that these young people build. They're the other safe, loving adults in their lives. My daughter sees our child care providers more than she sees me often during the week. And so um, it's so important that we take this seriously. I mean, we know that it's primarily women and women of color who provide these services. And so when we undervalue this critical work, like, yes, it's important for the children and for us as a state, but like we are devaluing these women and particularly women of color over and over and over again and just shows up in these systems. And so I just I want to thank you for bringing home that human aspect. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, We'll take one more question or comment, um, Senator Lucero, and then um, I'd like to, not because I, I want to shortchange the time, um, I think this is really valuable. I would like to hear from um, the Great Start Task Force folks because it, it is a, a way for us to bring, bring us back to what can we do um, in a positive way and how can we, how can we avoid some of the, the um, issues we're facing. So Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank the testifiers as well. It, uh, your, your passion certainly comes through, and we have deep, all of us, I think, on this committee share the deep uh, commitment to our young people, to families, uh, that you clearly have the passion for. One of the things that I can recall back from, I think it was the 2016, 2017 time frame, uh, there was a, a time, again, around that era, when one family care provider was closing in the state per day. And it was devastating. It was an incredible hardship at the time. And I'm not sure what the statistic is today, but yeah, one per day in the state was incredible hardship on the industry. And uh, the research shows that Minnesota is among, we're certainly in the top 10, and uh, I think in the top eight or nine, most expensive childcare costs in the country. And so the question is not why is it expensive? I'm wondering, Madam Chair, and to the testifiers, my question is do we know why it is so expensive in Minnesota? Um, Ms. McCulley? Senator um, Wickland and Senator Lucero. We don't have a lot of time. Um, I will say this quickly because I get this question a lot. First of all, when you look at those statistics and those rankings, and that happens to be, among other things, one of our national reports, that, may, that is a little bit truer for center-based care in Minnesota. That is not necessarily true for family child care costs. We are actually pretty much middle of the road, if not below. The other difference is regionally, it differs greatly. And so because we have over 6,000 still, despite drops in numbers, 6,500 or so family child care, and only about 2,000 centers. We're a very family child care oriented state. There are fewer centers 
when you look at the average cost, and most of the centers are in our largest metro areas where the costs are higher. So it skews, it's a little hard to put it, this is the problem with, right, with trying to average age groups and regions and settings. So the, 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 the answer is a little more nuanced than, but, but at the end of the day, yes, I think it's driven mostly by local expenses. And as we just talked about, we do try in Minnesota to do things like keep those ratios lower because that's important. And when you have more in, uh, staff, you have higher costs. Senator Lucero. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for that. So one of the things that in all of these things that we're discussing, all of these conversations in multiple areas of our society, obviously this morning, uh, uh, the youth, and particular uh, child care right now, I'm always trying to come at it wearing a hat of root cause analysis. And so even in the metro area, even if we didn't look at a statewide average, even if we did look at the metro, as was just suggested, and we look at the center-based rather than uh, family providers uh, or home care providers, what is the root cause that is driving up the cost? And I, and I did hear one answer, a potential answer, and that is uh, local expenses. So in any of these policies that we're, we're considering, we need to be wearing that hat of root cause analysis and that's where we need to tackle and have our policy to make changes at that, to, to stop or make modifications to whatever is driving up the cost to provide relief. Because if we uh, take other steps to, to subsidize, we're not actually changing the costs, we're just shifting the cost. And one of the things that I want to do is have Minnesota not in that top 10 uh, as the most expensive in the nation in any area. So thank you, Madam Chair, and again, I appreciate these valuable conversations as we, again, try to focus on root cause analysis. Um, Madam Chair, may I make up one comment? So as you saw that 70% of uh, the budgets typically, in some cases, are more, are, are staff, and so you actually can't make it cost less if we're gonna increase wages and benefits and then make this a desirable profession, and as we've heard also, we're asking early childhood educators to bring, be brain architects. We are really looking at helping them to have the highest quality relationships with these youngest children and to prioritize relationships with their families. And that cost will not go down. And so I think it is, you're right, that we co it costs money. And also, what are we getting for that investment? Because I don't think the cost will go down. But I think when we invest in the educators, what we're going to see, hopefully, is a, re uh, a lowered turnover rate. And any kind of turnover rate in any industry, you're going to see about a $5,000 per person. I would have to go to Dr. Aaron Sojourner to like verify that particular number. But it costs money every time you have somebody go out the door. And so when we can look at prioritizing keeping individuals in the profession, that may go down. But we have to have the wages and the benefits go up to stabilize staff in our child care centers and in family child care homes. Because every time somebody closes, it's an incredible loss to the community and an expense. Thank you. Thank you for summing that up. I appreciate it. Um, and now I'd, I'd like to move to the Great Start Task Force um, because it is a way that Senator Lucero, we, we are trying to address, you know, what are the root causes of of um, our challenges in Minnesota and what are some solutions that we can propose. The Great Start Task Force was uh, part of legislation or developed through legislation that came about in 2021. Uh, it's been a, an or, organized and meeting for over a year's time to prepare recommendations and, and the report that was um, issued yesterday. And I, I want to say that um, we probably, we won't have time, I don't think, to cover the overview of the governor's recommendation about the new department. And I'm going to leave that off because I think our committees, we could bring that back at another time. And I, I appreciate your, your being able to come here today to present. But I do want to give the task force um, co-chairs who are here and on Zoom um, a chance to, to give us a, an overview of the, the task force and the results um, that came out. And the report itself is um, quite lengthy. It's over 90 pages. It has a great deal of really interesting and valuable information in it, and I hope that members will take a look at that. But I'll turn it over um, to, let's see, Jenny Moses, are you going to begin? Or Actually, Shakira is, Bradshaw Shakira. will be kicking us off. Okay. Um, so if we could go to the Zoom pre presenters. Um, 
Shakira Bradshaw is one of the task force co-chairs. And if you could um, state your name and um, begin your, your testimony, I'd appreciate it. And I hope we can see her. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair Rickle, and I am Shakira Bradshaw. Um, and I was one of the co-chairs for the Great Start for um, Minnesota Children Task Force. Um, so to say thank you again to Chair Wicklin and um, to Senator Kunis and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here with you today. I'm Shakira Bradshaw, as I said. I am just so honored to be here today. Um, I served as one of the three co-chairs of the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force, and I'm a parent of two children in the state's really um, care and education system, or ACE system, as you're here today. Um, so our task force work is of great importance to me. The task force was proposed by early care and education advocates and legislators and signed a law in 2021 by Governor Waltz. The legislation establishing the task force had bipartisan support. We were asked to develop a plan and implementation timeline that ensures all families have access to affordable, high quality early care and education that enriches, nourishes, and supports children and their families. Um, this work was to develop a long-term vision for the state. The implementation timeline was directed to begin in July of 2025 and finish no later than July of 2031. Legislation directed the task force to meet monthly starting in November of 2021 with a draft report that was due in December of 2022. We submitted our final report on our deadline, which was yesterday, February 1st. So per statute, our task force had 15 voting members and 22 non-voting members and represented many aspects of and diverse voices within the early care and education system within Minnesota. Per statute, voting members included legislators, center directors, licensed child care providers, school center and Head Start based educators and members of a federally recognized tribe. Non-voting members included representatives of advocacy and business organizations, as well as state agency employees. And the view of us with you today served as the co-chairs, but I'll hand it over to Jenny now. Thank you. My name Thank is you. Jenny Moses, and I'm a program director with the Minnesota Children's Cabinet. The Children's Cabinet, housed within Minnesota Management and Bu Budget, refers to the convening of the state's commissioners around children and youth. Our team leads this interagency effort and has been charged by the governor and lieutenant governor with helping make Minnesota the best place for each and every child to grow up. Per statute, MMB was charged with providing staff and administrative services for the task force. Additionally, the statute required one representative of the Children's Cabinet to be a task force voting member. I served in that role and is one of the three co-chairs. I'll start with just a brief overview of the task force process. To address the aspects of the ECE system required by establishing legislation, task force members, staff, and facilitators held 15 meetings as a full group. Evening virtual meetings allowed for participation from across the state, including providers who cannot participate during regular business hours. Had two working groups that met nine times each to work more in depth on recommendations in the areas of affordability and workforce compensation engaged in office hours and surveys between meetings, reviewed existing reports, materials, and recommendations. We also held four listening sessions with the public, which was hosted by the co-chairs, which resulted in drafting, revising, and voting to approve recommendations for inclusion in this report. As we started our work together, we also found common ground in a few essential commitments that were approved by voting members. Identifying historically disenfranchised groups who have not experienced equity in the ECE system, the group agreed to center equity throughout their process of developing recommendations. Formal acknowledgement of a commitment to the MISC's delivery system, recognizing that all types of providers and settings provide value to families and children, and family preference must be honored and respected by design. Acknowledgement that care and edu education cannot be separated. Through the establishing statute, though, excuse me, though the establishing statute did not address the fiscal impact of the legislative charge and it was not within the scope of our work, the task force recognized that the recommendations would have significant financial implications. 
To fully understand these implications, the task force did recommend a fiscal study of each budget-related recommendation, a comprehensive economic impact assessment of the long-term recommendations, which should consider child and family outcomes, economic impacts, including potential savings and costs to taxpayers, and finally, a strategic financing study to identify and assess the impact of revenue options available and ways to maximize existing funding streams to cover the cost of the long-term plan. I'll turn it over to our third co-chair, Sandy, to review some of the key recommendations included in our report. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning, chairs and members. My name is Sandy Seimer, and I'm a Head Start educator at Families First in Rochester and co-chair of the task force. We don't have time to review all the recommendations included in the task force. Um, Report, I'll go over some of the key long and short term recommendations included, but I encourage everyone to consult the full report for a comprehensive picture. The first one is really big to create a family benefit system that provides affordable access to early care and education for all families with an affordability standard of no more than 7% of income for all families. The second bucket of recommendations is to provide early childhood programs with adequate funding to deliver effective services for children and families. And we are also asking that the early care and education workforce get paid at least a living wage. Finally, we want to invest in increasing access to effective programs. And slide nine, you can see that some of the short, these are some of the short term recommendations coming out of the task force. Again, this is not a comprehensive picture of the report, but a few recommendations to highlight, including expanding eligibility for the Child Care Assistance Program or CCAP and early learning scholarships. This includes the following short term recommendations for CCAP to expand eligibility to 85% of the state median income and by increasing eligible activities, to increase hours covered to ensure the continuity of care, reduce family co-payments for CCAP, and make permanent the reprioritization of basic sliding fee CCAP wait list. And for early learning scholarships, um, the short-term recommendations include increasing the scholarship funding to cover the full cost of care, to expand the scholarship age eligibility to inc include births to three, and then expand uh, priority populations for scholarships to include families with caregivers in a substance use of treatment, families experiencing domestic violence, families with an incarcerated caregiver, and families with a caregiver in a mental health treatment program. And then simplifying the administration system and reduce burden, including by effective electronic systems that can be updated, having one billing and tracking system for both programs, and making income eligibility guidelines consistent based on one metric, the percentage of the state medium income. Um, expand program funding amounts based on cost modeling and continuing base operational funding to support and expand efforts around family navigation of the system to conduct family focus groups to better understand barriers, including the potential barriers that are listed here. <clears throat> and then the endorsement of ongoing efforts, continuous improvement of parent aware and child care regulation moder modernization projects, planning efforts for technology, staffing, and programmatic changes, and expanding the Grow Your Own program in Minnesota transfer pathways to create regional substitute polls and conduct a workforce study to continue and expand programs for mental health supports, short term financial relief efforts like bonuses and compensation grants. Thank you, Chair Wickland, Chair Kunish, and the members of the committee for the time. And that is the end of our presentation. And if time allows, we'll pause for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, members, any questions? Senator Bolden? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to say, as, as being part of this task force, thank you uh, to the testifiers. I will just um, say that it really was an honor to serve in the task force. The commitment and passion and expertise of everyone on the task force was impressive. Um, 
we got through a lot of work then and had you know some difficult conversations um, and I'm really proud of the outcome and I'm excited to continue this work to, to move it forward. Um, there was really diversity of perspective and background um, of folks on the panel and are on the task force intentionally and I think that really um, benefits the work and the outcomes from it so thank you and just to note sort of in wrap up of our hearing I think this has been um, really valuable and helpful to sort of connect all of these pieces to hear about the brain science to hear about um, you know the the challenges and and the brokenness of this system and in thinking about root causes um, you know I think the root cause of the the expense of, of child care and where we're at is because care is not cheap and I don't want it to be it is important we should be valuing the people who are doing this brain architecture as was said so well it is important and we should be investing in that because it, it, it matters. Um, also, as we talk about root causes, um, you know, as we look at health outcomes and education outcomes and lots of other outcomes in our society, this, the first thousand days, the first three years in our little one's lives, that impacts all of that. So when we, we know, when we make investments in these first years, it pays dividends for generations to come. And so not only is it just the right thing to do, it also is just the smart thing to do. And so um, thank you for all who have testified today and I look forward to continuing this important work. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. Any other member questions or comments? Any closing thoughts? I will point out that in this same presentation, you'll see that the slides continue with the governor's budget, the alignment with the Great Start Task Force recommendations, um, so that you can see how the, the work came together in terms of our recommendations as a task force, um, and um, uh, in alignment with some of the things that the governor is proposing. And we have heard, uh, we had an overview in, in my committee with um, some of the human services proposals, but we, we can go into more depth on some of these proposals, or we will go into more depth on these proposals as we go forward. And then the last slide you'll see, um, I had hoped that we could have time for a proposed, um, a discussion about the proposed Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to do that today, but we may be able to make time in a, another committee hearing to, to do that, to have um, a chance to hear more about the reasoning behind that and how it fits into our efforts to improve our early care and education system in Minnesota and how it will it is one way that we could be helping families um, with the challenges that we've discussed today. So, um, and then last, I wanted to um, let members know that I had asked our fix, fiscal analyst to create a, a document with the early education, economic assistance, and child care appropriations, and this is for the 2023 regular session. You'll find that in your, in your packet, so you have a list of all of the different accounts that fall under education finance and then under Health and Human Services. And I thought that would be a way for the two committees to understand kind of how the, um, some of these uh, programs are divided between our committees. So I hope you'll take a look at that as well. Um, Senator Kunish, did you wanna uh, have some last words? Thank you, um, Chair Wickland, for putting this together. This was really, really good information for both of our committees, seeing as we, as you can tell from the um, spreadsheet, we, we do have um, commonalities around that. Um, I, I really appreciate the advocacy for families and children, but also those care providers. I myself was a family care provider for five years, and um, that was where probably even my own children will say some of the best years when they were young. Those were lifelong relationships that we built to this day. Um, we still are connected to those families and celebrate the successes and support those families as they have supported 
supported me through these years. And so it's not just a one and done um, sort of situation where um, it's a financial transaction and here's my kid, here's some money, um, do what you can and do the best you can. It really is important and I've, I've really um, loved to see how uh, we have progressed over the 30 years since I did childcare um, to really make this a, a, um, a um, uh, priority and to understand the struggles, not just of our families, but our care providers as well. So thank you all very much. Um, I may ask you to come back to my Education Finance Committee to do a little more in-depth discussion. But in the meantime, I do thank you ever so much for your dedication to to the children of Minnesota. So. Thank you all for coming in to present, and thank you members, and with no other um, matters before us, this committee is adjourned.